Is your eyelid twitching driving you crazy? In this video, I'm going to explain the best ways to treat and prevent your eyelid twitching. By the way, I'm Dr. Michael Chua. I'm a board certified ophthalmologist with Puente Hills Eye Care. And stick around until the end of the video because I'll also explain why all eyelid twitching is not the same. In some cases, it can even be the sign of a brain tumor. Now, by far, the most common form of eyelid twitching is what we call eyelid myokymia. In eyelid myokymia, we see that the eyelid muscle, which is called the orbicularis oculi, and the nerves controlling the muscles are overactive. We usually see and feel these constant rippling contractions throughout our eyelid muscle. Eyelid myokymia usually occurs unilaterally or on one side and more commonly affects the lower lid, although some patients can see the contractions in the upper lid instead. These episodes of contractions or twitching usually last a few seconds to hours, but in some patients, it can last for several days or weeks before resolving. Several medical studies have identified common triggers for eyelid myokymia, including fatigue, anxiety, stress, caffeine consumption, and eye strain. So let's go through some of the best ways to address these triggers to prevent and treat eyelid myokymia. Fatigue and lack of sleep is one of the most common triggers of eyelid myokymia, so getting good quality sleep is important. Since I see sleep problems so commonly in my patients with eyelid myokymia, I wanted to make a quick guide on how to optimize your sleep. I've had multiple patients who have told me that once they were able to improve their sleep, that their eyelid twitching resolved. Here are some of the best evidence-based ways to improve your sleep hygiene and to get better quality sleep. The first thing you want to do is to optimize your sleep environment. So let's deconstruct an ideal sleep environment. You want it to be as dark and quiet as possible. You can use blackout shades or curtains or even a nice quality sleep mask works great too. If you live in an area where you can't really control the noise, for example, when I was a resident, I lived in Manhattan near a hospital and there were constant cars honking, ambulances and sirens going off throughout the night, which made sleeping tough on some nights. If you're in a similar environment, you can use earplugs or a white noise machine to drown out startling noises. The ambient temperature or the temperature in your bedroom is also a critical factor to optimizing sleep. The best room temperature for sleep will vary depending on humidity levels, the amount of clothes you wear to bed, and the thickness of your blankets and comforters. But generally, 65 degrees Fahrenheit or 18.5 degrees Celsius is the sweet spot for most people. It can vary a bit depending on your preferences, but 65 degrees is a good starting point for your room temperature for sleep. Multiple studies have shown that increasing the ambient temperature, which can make your sleep environment stuffy and hot, leads to longer time to sleep onset, less total sleep, more frequent awakenings, and less time in slow wave or deep sleep. With your ambient room temperature set, you also want a nice comfortable comforter or a blanket to help you make a little nest as you sleep. This blanket nesting is important to keep your micro environment or the temperature directly around your body nice and regulated as you sleep. The next way to optimize your sleep is to take advantage of the warm shower effect. Recent research has shown that taking a hot 10 minute shower or bath about one hour before bed helps you fall asleep faster and helps you get better quality sleep. It's all covered in this research article, but the theory behind this is that there's a specific temperature regulation mechanism that occurs when we go to bed. As bedtime approaches, our core temperature begins to drop. Our core temperature, meaning the temperature in our torso and our abdomen, usually drops about one degree Celsius or two to three degrees Fahrenheit as we're sleeping. So how is our core able to drop its temperature? It uses the blood vessels in our hands and feet. Our hands and feet have a high density of these tiny blood vessels called capillaries. These capillaries play a critical role in regulating our body temperature. As we prepare to go to sleep, the capillaries in our hands and feet dilate, allowing increased blood flow to our extremities. Since we have more blood flowing slowly and hanging out in the dilated capillaries in our extremities, this allows heat to naturally be released into the cooler environment. Remember that our room temperature is cooler than our body temperature. So the blood in our extremities is able to cool down maybe one degree Celsius or so. Then this cooled blood is returned through our veins back to our core. And as that blood spreads throughout our organs and our chest and abdomen, our core temperature decreases. Taking a warm shower about an hour before bedtime helps jumpstart that dilation process in our extremities. The warm water will ever so slightly increase the temperature of our skin. Then neurons in our skin will then recognize this increase in temperature and send a signal to the thermal regulation centers in our brain, which would then trigger our body to release hormones to stimulate the dilation of blood vessels in our extremities to promote heat release. 
So a hot shower jump starts the dilation that occurs in our capillaries and our hands and feet, which is required for the critical heat release process that allows us to drop our core temperature to give us a comfortable night's sleep. And the clinical research backs this up. A warm shower about an hour before sleep improves physiologic sleep processes and results in a significantly decreased time to onset of sleep and a significant increase in sleep efficiency. These studies on thermoregulation are also clinically relevant, as multiple studies have shown that patients who struggle with insomnia have elevated body temperatures at night compared with those who don't have sleep problems. Another effective way to optimize your sleep is to go to bed and wake up at the same time every day as often as possible. A regular sleep routine can help regulate the circadian rhythm by aligning the body's natural sleep-wake cycle with the external environment. The circadian rhythm is controlled by an internal biological clock located in the hypothalamus in the brain. The hypothalamus receives input from light-sensitive cells in the retina of the eye, which helps to synchronize the internal clock with the external environment. A regular sleep routine in which you go to bed and wake up at the same time every day can help synchronize your internal clock with the external environment. This consistency in the sleep-wake cycle can reinforce the circadian rhythm and improve the quality of your sleep. Everyone's optimal amount of sleep varies, but most studies show that generally, people need between 7 and 9 hours of sleep per night. When you maintain a regular sleep routine, your body learns to anticipate sleep at a certain time, and your internal clock adjusts accordingly. As a result, your body begins to release hormones such as melatonin at the appropriate time which can help induce sleep and improve sleep quality. But Disruptions to the sleep routine, such as staying up late or sleeping in on weekends, can throw off the circadian rhythm and lead to sleep problems. So it's important to maintain a consistent sleep routine to help regulate the circadian rhythm and improve overall health and well-being. The next important factor to consider for sleep is your exposure to devices and blue light at night. Blue light exposure during the day can actually be beneficial as it can help regulate the circadian rhythm and promote wakefulness. Blue light is present in sunlight, and exposure to blue light during the day can help suppress the production of melatonin, that hormone which promotes sleep. This can help keep you more alert and improve your cognitive function during the day. But exposure to blue light at night can have the opposite effect and interfere with sleep. Multiple studies have shown that exposure to blue and violet light in the evening suppresses melatonin. Electronic devices such as smartphones, tablets, and computers all emit varying levels of blue light. Exposure to these devices at night can interfere with your natural production of melatonin and disrupt your circadian rhythm, making it harder to fall asleep and to stay asleep. This can lead to symptoms such as daytime fatigue, irritability, decreased cognitive function, and of course, increased eyelid twitches. To minimize the negative effects of blue light on sleep, I recommend to limit the use of electronic devices at night, especially in the hours leading up to bedtime. This can help promote the natural production of melatonin and improve sleep quality. Additionally, there are tools and apps available that can help filter out blue light from electronic devices, which can be useful for those who need to use these devices at night. Both iPhones and Android phones have some sort of night mode setting to decrease the blue light emitted by these devices. Okay, now that we covered sleep, let's cover some other things you can do to help resolve eyelid myokymia. The next common trigger of eyelid myokymia is anxiety and stress. Oftentimes, patients say they notice their eyelid twitching when they have a big project at work or a big exam coming up or some other stressors going on in their life. You can try some effective relaxation techniques like breathing exercises, meditation, or other cognitive behavior therapy techniques to help you manage stressful life situations. Caffeine is also a common trigger associated with eyelid twitching. Caffeine is a stimulant and can increase the excitability of the nerves around your eyelids. If you're struggling with an annoying eyelid twitch, try cutting back on your coffee, espresso, tea, or energy drinks to see if that helps. Another common trigger for eyelid myokymia is dry eye and eye strain. Many patients mention that the twitching is worse while trying to read a book or a report or when working on the computer for a long time. Some ways to treat your eye strain and dry eye are to remember the 20-20-20 rule. Every 20 minutes, take a 20 second blink break and stare out into the distance, about 20 feet away. You can also use a good lubricating eye drop like Retain or Sustain Complete if your eyes are feeling gritty or dry. And you can use an electric warm compress therapy device like the Aroma Season device once or twice a day for 20 minutes to help open up the oil glands along your eyelids to help retain the moisture on your eyes. Okay, so we talked about the best methods to try to decrease and prevent eyelid myokymia. But as an eye doctor, there are many other important factors I need to consider when a patient comes to me complaining of eye twitching. My first priority is that I need to diagnose the condition correctly. 
That's because certain types of facial spasms may actually be a presenting sign of something going on in the brain, like multiple sclerosis or a brain tumor or an aneurysm. So I need to quickly figure out if you have a benign type of twitch, like eyelid myokamia or one of the more dangerous types. So let's discuss some of the different types of facial spasms so you can learn about which types you should really worry about. Now, if a patient comes to me with some spasming of one eyelid, usually the lower eyelid unilaterally or on one side of the face, so one muscle in one eyelid in one side of the face, then yeah, I treat it as eyelid myokamia, which thankfully is benign, and I go through all the things we just discussed, like stress reduction, improved sleep, and decreasing caffeine intake. But if instead that patient also mentioned that they have these small twitches or fasciculations not only on the eyelid, but also on the mid face and the lower face, such as the cheek or around the mouth, then alarm bells are going off in my head because that's no longer just eyelid myokymia. I'm treating facial myokymia. And this distinction is important because the facial nerve or the nerve that controls the facial movements in your face originates from the brainstem. And facial myokymia could be the first presenting sign of a serious condition like multiple sclerosis or a brain tumor. So if a patient has facial myokymia, they need a brain MRI to evaluate for these conditions. If a patient has bilateral or both sides of the face, bilateral stronger contractions and spasming of the lids, then that's a condition we call benign essential blepharospasm. Thankfully, the first word in the condition is benign, so not dangerous, but it can be bothersome. So if patients are bothered by their benign essential blepharospasm, then I offer Botox and patients usually have great relief with treatment. Now, if the bilateral eyelid spasms also include contractions of the whole face, not just the eyes, but also the lower face and the mouth area, then it would be what's called Mej syndrome, which also responds well to Botox. But if the spasms and contractions are in the upper and lower part in just one half of your face, then that's what we call hemifacial spasm. And hemifacial spasm is usually caused by something compressing the facial nerve in the brainstem, like a blood vessel. Sometimes though, although it's less likely, but very much possible, it can be something more dangerous in the brain, like a brain tumor or an aneurysm. So patients with a hemifacial spasm need a brain MRI to rule out those possibilities. So in summary, small eyelid twitching in one muscle and one eyelid on one side of the face is eyelid myokymia, which we treat and prevent through lifestyle changes like improving sleep, stress relaxation techniques, treating eye strain and dryness, and decreasing caffeine intake. But if you have twitching in the upper and lower part of the face unilaterally or on one side of the face, then we'd be concerned for conditions like facial myokamia or hemifacial spasm, and you need a brain MRI to evaluate for any pathology in the brainstem. Stronger contractions and spasms of both eyelids is called benign essential blepharospasm, while strong contractions of the upper and lower part of the face on both sides, basically the whole face, is called Mej syndrome. Both benign essential blepharospasm and Mej syndrome can be treated with Botox. So facial twitches and spasms come in all shapes and sizes, but some types are more dangerous than others. If you're struggling with eyelid twitching, I'd recommend seeing an ophthalmologist who can help you correctly diagnose what's going on and walk you through the best treatment options. If you found the information in this video helpful, please remember to give us a thumbs up and subscribe for future updates. And if you live in the Los Angeles, Orange County, or Inland Empire area and want to get your eyelid twitching checked out, feel free to visit our website or give our phone number a call to make an appointment today. And if you made it to the end of this video, that means you're probably really motivated and interested to learn more about eye health. You can check out my video here to learn about the best ways to prevent and treat eyelid aging. See you next time.